What up, fifth grade? You ready to read? I'm ready to read because there's just, there's so many times, there's only so many times I can walk around the block. <laughs> How many times can you do that? There's nothing to do. Um, if you've noticed, Miss Berkman cut her hair. She's so bored, she chopped her hair off. Don't do that. Don't do that because it's not a good choice. Not good life choices. Take it from Miss Bergman. Cutting your hair at home is not a good life choice. Um, but when you're bored, you're bored. So, you know, I guess we should probably read, right? When you're bored, you're bored. Let's read instead. Um, seven clues to home. Do, 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 do. Your bookmark fell out, 5K. I'm so sorry. Your bookmark fell out. So I'm kind of guesstimating where we left off because also we hadn't had library for a couple of weeks. So 5H got to really um, read ahead of you by a lot. By like a lot, a lot. So I think we are on this chapter, this Lucas chapter, I also have to hold up some, this Lucas chapter where right as he's leaving the B&B &B tackle shop, a hand comes onto his shoulder and says like, what are you doing here? So he thinks the owner is like coming after him for doing something wrong. Um, comment and tell me if I've gone like too far back. There's nothing you can do about it after I post this and upload it. But you know, just for my own uh, peace of mind, I'm wondering if I went too far back or not. Um, but also this is good for the, for those of you who are in Mrs. Uh, Grasser's, uh, extra class there and you come in a little bit later, if I back up a little bit, you kind of get more of the story. So this is kind of for you guys. So even if I back up really far, this is for those kiddos who miss the story anyway, because they're off doing other things, other important things. So we're on the Lucas chapter. Here we go. What are you doing here? A hand squeezes tighter. I don't look up, my mind trying to sort if I did something wrong. I didn't steal anything, but I trespassed, I guess. Acted like I had the right to go sticking clues under merchandise. Lucas? The hand shakes my shoulder. The deep voice sounds familiar. I bring myself to look up. It's nice to see you here. How's your summer going? It's not the owner scolding me for anything at all. My heart does a smile. It's Mr. Carter from second grade. I mean, I think it is. His black curly hair is grayish now and shorter, right to his head, while his face looks younger than I remember, which makes those two things contradictory. But when I look a little longer, he has the same eye crinkling smile and I definitely know the voice. So I'm sure. He holds a tackle box in his free hand. A white bucket with a rod sticking out sits next to him on the ground. We must be heading down to the marina to fish. A feeling of guilt washes over me. I always liked Mr. Carter, and I meant to go say hi to him, but I haven't seen him in so long because he's still in the elementary school, and Joy and me have been in the middle school for a whole year. And even before we moved to the middle school for sixth grade, the fourth and fifth grades were in a whole other wing from the lower grades. So unless he was on, a cafete on cafeteria duty or something, I didn't really run into him. But here he is now, smiling with his booming voice and a big old hand on my shoulder. I look down self-consciously for a second and then remember what he taught us and force myself to look back up at him again and hold my gaze there. He nods, proud-like, and says, So, now, a proper greeting, and holds his hand out to me to shake. And I nearly start laughing, because now I remember this hilarious thing he used to do when we were in his class when he was always teaching us things besides reading and math. Things he learned in the Navy, he said, serving our country. Like, always be polite, always walk with your head held up, and never look down like you're afraid. And when you're talking to someone, always look them sharp in the eyes. Speak clearly and slowly with a purpose, and always, always shake a new person's hand. Firm grip like you mean it. He'd demonstrate holding his hand straight in midair to shake an invisible person's hand. And then he'd loosen his fingers and drop his wrist down all floppy and say, 
None of this I'm shaking hands with a dead fish sort of thing. He was strict about it, too, and every once in a while, he would line us all up for handshaking drill practice, and each of us would have to walk across the room to him, one at a time, head up and say, Hello, Mr. Carter, how are you? Looking, st looking him straight in the eye. I bet a lot of kids forgot how he taught us that stuff. But I remember because it seemed so important to him that I learned. And here's the funny part. Even though most of the time he was super serious about it, sometimes when you made it across the room, he said, and said, hello, Mr. Carter, how are you? He would say, oh, I'm fine, Lucas. Thanks for asking. Then he'd hold out his hand for you to shake. And if you were that lucky kid that day, instead of a normal firm Navy handshake, you would get the milkshake handshake. Uh, with Mr. Carter gripping your hand and making it jiggle up and down and up and down a million miles per hour so fast your arm looked like a crazy vibrating rubber band. And if you opened your mouth to talk while he was shaking, your words would jiggle and vibrate too, like someone was putting them through a washing machine. Hello, Mr. Carter, your words would go. And the best part would be you'd be laughing, but he'd act all serious and just keep shaking your hand, jiggling your arm all crazy fast while saying, Stop that, Lucas. Why are you doing this to me? Only, of course, you weren't doing it. He was the one doing it, and you were the one laughing, while the next kid was anxiously waiting for her turn in line. Now I'm grinning like a dope, staring at his hand like maybe he'll remember uh, and milkshake handshake me. But all he does is squeeze my hand warmly, two times, firmly, and says, That's a nice strong grip you've got, Lucas. He lets go. I feel a little disappointed. I'm good, sir. I say, not even sure, he asked me. Well, glad to hear it, son. Very glad. You've grown some. I almost didn't recognize you. And I don't know if it's my disappointment, or the way he's holding my stare like he's he really needs me to know how truly glad he is. Or maybe because he called me son. But for a second, I feel really bad that I never went back to his classroom to visit him. Sorry, Mr. Carter, I say when I've swallowed back the sad feeling and can look up again. It's okay, Lucas. Sometimes it's overwhelming to see old friends. I nod, wondering if that's true. And if an old teacher can actually become your friend. Where were you headed? Oh, where were you headed? Maybe you got a few minutes to sit? He nods toward the end of the marina. I was just going to do a little fishing. Fishing and meditation. He chuckles. Half hour tops. As you can see, he nods down at the rented equipment. It wasn't in my original plan this morning, but I find myself with a canceled appointment, so I thought I'd dangle a line for a bit. Strictly catch and release. Never can bring myself to keep them even to eat. He chuckles again, and I nod in agreement. Me neither. And yeah, okay, I say, forgetting about time running out to get the hunt set, and already starting to walk with him. Chapter 8. Joy. Natalia will be here any minute, because somehow my fingers remembered her cell phone number and pressed the right buttons, and she answered her phone, uh, ex and she answered her phone before I even heard it ringing on my end. She wasn't exactly happy with me, but she said she wouldn't be so mad either. She promised she'd smooth things over with our parents and that no, they hadn't contacted the police yet, but yes, I'd probably call just in the nick of time. I told my sister where I was, and oddly, she didn't ask why. Which is probably because, since she got her driver's license last month, she'll take any excuse to borrow Dad's pickup. When I told her I'd wait for her outside B&B Sport and Tackle, all she said was that she'd be there in five minutes. In Natalia Fon's second time, that could be 25 minutes to half an hour. But I don't care. I don't mind the wait. The tide is starting to come in. It swirls around the whole peninsula of Port Bennington, straight from the salty ocean, and up onto every bay inlet and into the sound and over the narrow strip of beach. It covers the black mud and creeps up into the water marks on the pilings and the rocks. It swallows the green algae and laps gently at the sand. I sit and swing my legs off the end of the pier. I'll be able to see Natalia when she pulls in. Meanwhile, I just need to be here for a minute more with the sun on my face. There's a heron on the opposite side walking its graceful stick walk in and out of the surf, just like nobody's business, and I know what it's telling me. It's over. No more clues. Time to go home, the heron would say if it could talk. 
Hey, kiddo. I spin around. It's not Natalia. It's a man in a white t-shirt and a big belly. Yeah? The man waits at the foot of the pier. He doesn't come closer. Instead, he points back toward the tackle shop. Patrick, my son, the boy you were talking to inside, he calls to me. He said you were looking for something. The Rebel Rocket? Lucas once told me, there is an infinite number of moments in every second. In every second that you can have and then have again and again and again. There is still time left. It might be too small for our brains to comprehend, but it exists simply because of the math of it and is in one of those fractions of a moment of a second. And it is in one of those fractions of a moment of a second. I let myself get my hopes up again. We're all sold out of those, the man tells me. But maybe you were looking for someone then, he continues. Maybe I know what you were looking for. That boy who used to come here all the time. I feel terrible about it now. On the opposite side of the water, the heron lifts into the air. That brunetti kid, he came in here that day. Right before. He stops like he can't say the words. I get that. He went right for that same reel you were asking about. The rocket. He had it in his hands. The one you were looking for came in so fast and dashed back out like he was up to no good. Like his brother, I figured. I figured he stole something. I was about to chase after him. The heron hunches its shoulders, then spreads its wings across the sky, past the sun, and lets its shiny legs dangle below. But then I saw him right outside, so I guess he wasn't running away or anything. I always felt bad about that, you know, considering what happened. I just wanted to let you know, I always felt bad about it. Higher and higher. I just stare at the guy, he doesn't walk away. Anyways, then like a month or whatever later, he tells me, I go to sell that same rebel rocket to some guy from Manhasset, and I see this little note underneath, and it's got a name on it. What name? The heron is almost out of sight. Look, I didn't think anything of it. I didn't even put two and two together till just now. Till you came along asking for that same reel. It must be you, right? Look, I didn't know, okay? It's a tiny dot against the blue. The man shrugs like he is casting off a heavy coat, one he's been wearing for too long. I didn't know. I don't remember, so I threw it out. I'm sorry, okay? I really hope it wasn't anything important. Smaller and smaller, and it's gone. I stand up when I spot Natalia driving up in our dad's truck. She's got the windows down, her hair blowing behind her and the music blasting. The man is already heading back into his shop. He looks helpless. Or maybe it's me. Maybe I feel helpless. At least my sister is here. I can tell her everything now. Now that it's over, I start to head down the pier. It's okay, I tell myself. After the last whole year I've been through, this really isn't so bad. Nothing could be that bad. This is nothing compared to that. Natalia shifts into park and waves at me. Then just before I walk over to the passenger side and get in, the man in the white t-shirt calls out to me again. He's standing in the doorway of his shop. Hey, I don't know if this helps or anything, but I did see your friend talking with that black dude that always comes in here. I think he's a teacher from the elementary school. Mr. Carter? I ask. Yeah, that's him. I saw him and that brunetti kid talking, like, for a long time. Yeah, and they were fishing, right outside, right where you were just sitting. I raise my hand to wave at him. Thanks, I say back, like I'm forgiving him. And me. Lucas. This is a Lucas chapter. The sun is doing that sparkle popcorn thing off the water today, and maybe it's that. Or maybe it's being with Mr. Carter that feel, fills me with this feeling that everything is calm and good. I'm happy to be taking a break, sitting on the edge of the pier with him, even if I'm also worried about slowing down and not getting the scavenger hunt finished. But I have plenty of time, and no one is at home to worry about me. 
It must be heading toward low tide because with our legs over the side, our feet dangling down, there's still a four or five foot drop to the water. Mr. Carter opens the tackle box, baits the line, and casts out. He hums for a minute, some song I don't know, then pulls back on the line too quickly. He reels it back in, slack and empty, shaking his head before casting it out again. You have to be more patient than that, I say, and he laughs. Give the fish a bit more time. Apparently I'm a little rusty, he says. I used to fish with my dad as a boy all the time, and now and again as we both got older. He passed on a few years ago, and I haven't been out since. I find myself thinking a lot about him lately. I nod because I'm not sure what to say. Besides, I think I know what he's doing, because it's something else people do all the time. Find ways to talk about my dad without really asking. Or maybe he knows about Rand, but now he's gone too. Anyway, losing his dad is probably harder for him than it is for me, because he knew his father his whole lifetime, a whole lot longer than I knew mine. But I don't say that because I don't want it to sound mean. I was doing a scavenger hunt just before, I blurt instead. Well, setting one up, I mean, for Joy Fonseca. It's her birthday tomorrow. She was in your class too, remember? She's my best friend now. Of course I remember Joy, Mr. Carter says. He turns and looks at me amused. Go figure, Lucas Brunetti and Joy Fonseca. I wouldn't have pegged the two of you as lifelong friends. He winks at that. So I'm not sure what he's trying to tell me, but it doesn't matter because my brain is sticking to the word lifelong. Here it goes, then. I wish we could always be friends. Well, we are, I say, lifelong best. And then I get that same squeeze in the pit of my stomach as I did when we were little, and Joy's sister Natalia and her parents would watch me so, so closely every time I came over and hung out there, like they were waiting for me to do something bad, take something that didn't belong to me. Her and me, I add to make a point, have spent practically every day friends, ever since the last day of your class in second grade. She and I, Mr. Carter says, fixing my grammar, which makes my ears burn bright red. For a split second, I almost get mad, but then he says, And however it happened, I'm glad to hear it. She was a smart girl, good work ethic. She could almost keep up in math with the likes of you. He yanks on the line, which is slack. So when he reels it in, of course, the lure dangles shiny in the sun. He casts back out with a sigh uh, and pats my back. So tell me about this scavenger hunt thing. I explain how we've been doing them since that summer right after his class and how it kind of started with the cupcakes and both of us having cruddy summer birthdays. How when we were little, we'd keep the hunt small and in one spot. But this year, I wanted it to be special. I even got her this super special necklace to find at the end. I stopped there, my ears burning again, because even though I didn't say that it's a heart or anything about the letter or about me feeling stuff for joy that maybe I'm not supposed to feel, whatever I did say makes Mr. Carter turn. You know, he says, his eyes twinkling, if you still need a good hiding spot, I know the best one. His hand, oh, he hands me the rod and stands, stretching his legs before cupping his hand to his eyes to stare off toward the park and the gazebo. Look there, he points. The tree in the center. Must be 30 years old now because it was really big when we first discovered it. You see it there? I nod, not sure if I do. The heart-shaped tree with a whale's eye. Even from here you can see the top of it. The whale's eye? I ask, not going near that heart part he's talking about. Yes, third from the gazebo. You see? He points again across the length of the marina and down the long stretch of lawn toward where the big white gazebo sits in the center. In the summertime, they have small concerts there, mostly barbershop quartets, or even harpists sometimes. The area around the gazebo is circled with trees. It's easier to see how it's heart-shaped in the fall, because now in summer, its leaves are fuller. You see what I mean? You might have to stand up a point. I don't stand because I got, I've got the line cast out, and it feels like something might, might be biting, but I do count silently to try and see if I can tell which one it is from here while Mr. Carter keeps talking. So, back when the missus and I were still dating, now granted this was in high school, so I was still pretty smitten, though she will tell you I continue to be a hopeless romantic to this day, we used to do something similar. Not a hunt, exactly. He pauses thoughtfully because that's how he is about his words. 
And not that I'm insinuating anything about you and Miss Fonseca, to be clear. But we would leave each other love notes, tucked in the hole made by a rather large knot in that very tree. If you stand, you will see the tree's trunk splits and its limbs bow out, making this shape. He demonstrates with his hands. And especially in the fall, when the leaves turn red and orange and pink. Well, my oh my, Lucas, if that dang tree doesn't look just like an enormous leafy heart. And the whale's eye? I ask, not that I care necessarily. I mean, not really, because the hunt is pretty much set in my head, and it took me a while to think of the clues, and I already know where the rest of them are supposed to go. On the other hand, I do have a pen and a small spiral, uh, a small spiral pad. If I really want to redo things, and it's hard to resist what Mr. Carter is telling me. It's not for the next, if not for the next clue, then for the one that will send Joy back home. The knot he's saying, right below where the split begins, and the way the bark around it bulges out and below it, well, it creates a big old wrinkly lid. It's nearly impossible not to see Moby Dick. Moby who? I ask, my eyes getting big with surprise. Mr. Carter laughs again. <laughs> Moby Dick, from the Melville story. He's a famous literary whale. All right, I say, even though I still don't know. Then we fish for a few minutes more, but I don't catch anything. Uh, before Mr. Carter says, Well, Lucas, I should probably get going now. I walk Mr. Carter halfway back to B&B's, but then stop explaining I should probably get on with the hiding of the clues. Indeed you should, he said. Miss Fonseca is lucky to have you as her friend. I nod. I was super glad to see you, Mr. Carter, I say. He puts a hand on my shoulder and holds my gaze. Sure thing. Me too. It was a pleasure to have this time with you, son. Thanks again, I call as I start to walk away. The sun is high in the sky, a tighter, smaller ball of burning light. The air holds a slight chill. It must be even later than I think it is. Mr. Brunetti? I turn, surprised to see Mr. Carter still standing where I left him. I take a few steps back. Yeah? Don't ever be afraid to follow your heart he says. Chapter 9. Joy. My sister swings dad's truck into the lot behind Greer's diner. The tires grind over the gravel. She steps on the clutch, flips the shifter into park, and shuts the engine. Most of me just wants to go home, crawl into bed, and feel sorry for myself. But Natalia seems to be ignoring that. Don't we have to get back? I slump down in the seat. I was hungry an hour or two ago, but that feeling passed. Aren't mom and dad mad at me? I talked to them. I told them they had to lay off a bit. That you were fine. You just had some stuff you had to do. Uh, you just had some stuff you had to take care of. Oh, yeah. What stuff? What are you talking about? I ask innocently. Natalia and I both sit facing forward, not looking at each other, but totally connected. That's how it's always been with my older sister. We can go weeks without saying much more than, where? When are you going to get out of the bathroom? but neither one of us is ever that far away. I turn and look out the passenger side window at a huge hill of dirt cut from the side of earth. At the top, trees are clinging for their lives. Just beyond that, the woods and the bus shelter. No, not the bus shelter. I must have that wrong. It's not right here, is it, Lucas? Isn't that your friend Audrey from school? Natalia taps on the window. Yeah, that's her. I'm watching Audrey and her mom coming out of the diner, each of them holding their leftovers in, the styro in styrofoam containers, but their car is parked closer to the entrance, so sh she won't see me unless I get out and wave or something, which I don't feel like doing. Didn't you used to play with her a lot? Natalia asks. Play with her? I'm not six, Natty. We both watch as Audrey's mom nearly drops her leftovers, getting out her keys, but she deftly manages to unlock the car, and they both get in. I didn't mean it that way. I'm just saying, you guys used to hang out more, I remember. Natalia puts her two hands back on the steering wheel and sighs. <sighs> Look, about Lucas, I know what you're doing, she says. We did used to hang out more. Audrey's car backs up and swings out of the parking lot. But wait, Natalia couldn't. She couldn't know everything. She might know that Lucas and I did scavenger hunts on our birthday. But she couldn't know where I had been, uh, where I had been today, or where I was going. Even I didn't know that. Unless she opened the envelope, 
the one Lucas slid under our front door a year ago today, unless she had read it. And no, I didn't read your note from Lucas, if that's what you're thinking, but I did see it. I'm the one that first put it in your room, Dodo Bird. Natalia put the letter, the first clue, in my room? Of course, how else could it have gotten there? It kind of makes sense. That morning, the police rang our bell. They came inside. They told us what they told us. They asked my parents some questions. They asked me some things of which I have absolutely no memory whatsoever. I don't remember what the officers looked like or how many of them there were or if they were policemen or police women. Everything in my brain goes quiet after that. Blank. I never thought to wonder how Lucas's note got into my room, onto my desk, my name on top, his handwriting. The envelope I didn't open. I stuffed it in my bottom drawer and never looked at it again. Until this morning, of course. My sister found it that morning, didn't she? Natalia was the one who put it in my room. Where? I asked. It was under our front porch. I didn't want it to get all trampled on with all the, you know, people walking in and out. Thanks. I slouched down in the seat, pressing my knees against the glove compartment. I never opened it, my sister tells me, but I knew you would one day when you were ready. So yeah, nothing gets by me. Not everything, I say softly. You don't know how I scared him away. Who, Natalia asks me. The smell of hamburgers wafts across the parking lot and into the truck's open windows. My stomach rumbles. Lucas, I answer. Now I am remembering a little. It was a woman, a woman police officer, and I remember what the policewoman asked. She was nice. She had long blonde hair and a ponytail, like you wouldn't think for a police person. She sat down on the couch next to me and talked softly. Do you recall the last time you spoke? Of course I knew. I would never forget. It had just been the night before my birthday on the phone. I invited him over for breakfast like I do every year. And every year he says, no thanks, cake is enough celebrating for me. Of course, I knew it was hard for him to be around my family sometimes. There were so many of us. Davy and Isabel never left him alone, grabbing onto his legs and begging him to pick them up, toss them around, walk with uh, their feet on top of his. I knew he worried about leftover feelings from when Natalia held on to stuff she'd heard about Lucas's brother. I get it. Stories can stick to people, especially bad ones, like pancake syrup on the kitchen counter. But he didn't need to be worried. Once they got to know him, my whole family loved him. Lucas is not his brother. I'd tell Natalia when we were alone. I knew that was true, but I didn't really know anything about Justin, because I never really spent any time at their house. And not just because my parents were so overprotective, but I don't think Lucas really wanted me there. He didn't like his mom's boyfriend, Rand, and he never knew what stupid thing his brother was going to do. Lucas was always trying to protect me, and I scared him away. You could have never scared Lucas away, Natalia tells me. But I did, I say. I may have told him I loved him. Natalia doesn't turn to look at me exactly, but I can feel her whole body shift. She's actually trying not to look at me, like she knows I might stop talking if she does. But I want to talk. I've never told anyone what happened. It's not what I was trying to say, I begin. I was trying to say something else. Like what, she asked. Like... When he said he didn't want to come to breakfast, I was going to say something like, Well, okay, but you know I'd love you to come. But that's not how it came out? No. If I stare really hard at that hill of dirt over there, it gets all blurry until I can't make out a tree from a rock from what is nothing, excuse me, from what is nothing more than a big sheet of plexiglass surrounded metal. Lucas, I remember sitting with you there that day in the rain, the story you told me. Natalia leans back against the headrest. And what's wrong with that? He didn't like me like that, Natty. Not that way, I mean. We were best friends. Friends. That's all. The best thing about my sister is that she's not my mom. Or my dad. She's not going to try and talk me out of how I feel. Or tell me I'm wrong. She just listens. I go on. It was probably so embarrassing for him, too. I don't even know if he really heard me. Maybe he didn't because he didn't say anything back. 
But you know Lucas, he never does. So maybe he did hear me. Is that what you are upset about? That you told him you loved him or that you think you did? Wow, well, now that I'm here, I might as well go all the way. No, it's not that, I say. It's not that I'm worried if he heard what I said. I stop a minute because it's really the first time I'm remembering any of this so clearly. It's like I'd be more upset if he didn't. If he didn't hear me. If I never got to say it to him. If I never got to say to him, to tell him I love him. Natalia is nodding her head. Okay, look. I say we go in and have a burger. It's already 1.30, then you can tell me everything that's happened. My stomach growls in agreement. Okay, fine, I say. We both get out of the truck and slam the squeaky door shut behind us. So, hey, what did a different kind of pie mean, anyway? Natalia asks me as we head toward the back door into Greer's diner. Was it, like, pizza pie? Is that Vincent's? But I grind my feet to a halt in the gravel. I smack my sister in the arm. Hey, wait a minute, I say, hitting her again. I thought you said you didn't look in the envelope. You did, didn't you? I might have peeked, Natalia says, and she starts to run ahead across the parking lot. I chase after her, knowing when we get inside and sit down, I'm going to tell her everything from the waitress to Vincent's to Thea to the Revo Rocket. And how now I'm thinking maybe Mr. Carter knows something. Maybe he knows where Lucas was heading to next. And I'm going to ask my sister if we can find him. I'm not ready to let this go. Not yet. Lucas chapter. Cut it out, Lucas. That's not true and you know it. Joy punches me hard on the arm and I laugh because she's not laughing. Oh, and I laugh, but she's not laughing. It's not really called that, is it? That's what I'm thinking about now on the way to the library, after I find the whale's eye knot in the heart-shaped tree and plant the last clue there. How Joy punches me that day in the rain when I try to tell her about Execution Rocks. A few weeks ago after we ran up to the bus shelter, behind Greer's. I don't know why my brain keeps doing that, thinking about stuff with Joy like a movie in my head that won't stop playing. It is true or I wouldn't say it, I swear. That's why they call it that. Or at least some people say is not. She shivers, so I move closer. Like, maybe it will help keep her warm, and maybe my shoulder accidentally bumps hers. And you're creeping me out, she says. I move away quick, but then realize she just means the story, not me. So I feel dumb, because I never used to feel so confused around Joy. Okay, fine then. Go ahead and finish about the island. Otherwise, I'll just keep wondering. I smile a little because Joy can be like that, scared and curious both at the same time. Okay, but only if you don't punch me again. She nods, wrapping her arms around her chest, and shivers some more. But this time, I don't try to help because it's the middle of July, so it's not like she's going to freeze to death. The reason we're soaking wet and up in the bus shelter in the first place is because Joy has some money to burn. Mucho babysitting, she had texted me earlier. Let's go to Greer's. Not me, I texted back, because I've been saving all my dog walking money for her birthday gift. But she wrote back. It's cool. I can pay for lunch. Then a block from Greer's, the sky had turned black, and the clouds had opened up, raining down on us like Niagara Falls. Which is when I remembered the bus shelter that Justin and his friends helped the seniors move from near the school to up here as part of some senior prank this past summer. Up behind Greer's, can you believe it? He had come home at like four in the morning, waking me up, laughing and bragging about carting it up the hillside in the middle of the night. You should have seen it, Luca Lele, all the way up that hill. It was freaking hilarious. He was talking like that all loud and crazy, making up dumb nicknames for me on the spot, which probably meant he'd been drinking. So I was worried he was going to wake mom. And now that Rand was gone, she was back to getting no rest, working all kinds of double shifts. So anyway, I told Joy, at least that's the way Dad uh, told Justin the story about the island, and later Justin told it to me. I lean out of the shelter to grab a stick that's poking from some leaves and use that like a pointer to draw a pr uh, pretend map on the plexiglass window in front of us. There are a whole bunch of little islands out there, but most of them are just green, no buildings or anything, and impossible to see from shore. But this one here, I tap with the stick for emphasis, 
is the one with the white lighthouse. If you look hard and squint, you can see it out there. Execution rocks. Joy rolls her eyes a little like she doesn't believe me about the whole name thing. Right, which is, uh, which is called that because they used to bring prisoners there to die. By execution, she said, shuddering a little. Well, yeah, but not exactly. What they do is tie them to the rocks at low tide, and when the water would come in, voila, no more prisoners to deal with anymore. I toss the stick back out into the woods. Creepy and horrible, Joy says. They really did that? There's hope in her voice that it's not true. Well, probably not, I tell her. In fact, if you Google it, it says it's only called that because of the jagged rocks that surround the island that get completely submerged at high tide. So the fishermen who don't know about them can get their boats stuck if they're not careful navigating out there. That still sounds pretty dangerous, Joy says. I guess if you're stupid and don't know what you're doing, and you don't pay attention to the tides. But you do? Yeah, of course. I even have a tide chart on my phone. I pat my pocket. And if you don't believe me, they give tours there, and you can rent the lighthouse for a sleepover. So there are boats going to and from the island all the time. Really? Yeah, sure. Okay, then. She leans her head against my shoulder, and my heart starts pounding so loud, I'm sure she's going to hear it in the quiet. Quiet. The rain has stopped. My hands are sweating. We should probably go to Greer's now, I say fast. Yeah, okay, sure. She gets up and we both start walking. But all the way to Greer's, I can still feel the warm spot on her, uh, I can still feel the warm spot where her head was just resting on my shoulders. All right, guys, that's where I'm stopping. We're on chapter 10 now. If you would like to keep listening to the story, click on um, 5H's 7 Clues to Home video. This is where I start with them because this is where they left off. Um, and I read up until chapter 12. So I read about, um, what is that, 15 pages or so. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for joining me today. Um, being here, I guess, at home, in bed um relaxing it, it just gives you guys something to do it gives miss bergman something to do um yeah uh like i said uh earlier maybe i didn't say it uh but leave some comments below tell me what you're doing tell me like your favorite thing that uh you've done so far tell me about the book you're reading if you're reading a book at home um you know let's chat <laughs> i'm bored let's have miss bergman not be bored um also you guys want to say hi to someone? Hold on. Say hi, Luna. I got Luna here. We're just chilling. Here's Luna. We just chilling. We're hanging out. Whoop. Can we see her in, in her little log? She's in her little log, as always, so you know she's fine. So, yeah, thanks for listening, you guys. I hope you're enjoying the story. I know I am, and, like, with each clue, there we get to see, like, more on the cover. Like, look, here's the, here's the heart-shaped tree, and um, here's, here's the lighthouse, and down here's the pizza... Is there a peacock feather? Yep, right here. Peacock feather. Right here. So, we're we're getting through it here, guys. This is fun. Um, again, thanks for joining me. I uh, will make some more of these. You know, these, I'll tell you, this took me a couple hours. Because this is about the fourth time I've read and recorded. Um, because of mishaps and things that happened, camera falling, cat jumping on top of the camera, that did happen once. Um, so, you know, I kind of do these every other day or so. They take a lot out of Miss Bergman and it's drying of the throat, the throat dries. So, yeah, I will probably do another one of these day after tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow I'll do, um, oh, I might do tomorrow a, a picture book 
for, you know, those of you who have little siblings. I picked this book up right before the uh, pandemic started. It's the A is for Audra. It's uh, Broadway's le leading ladies from A to Z, you know, because I like the theater and there's, you know, people from the theater in here. And it's like a, it's like w it was Women's Month or Women's Day and have to empower women and such. I, yeah, I don't know. Women are pretty empowered, so. All right, guys. Thank you for joining me. I'll see you guys um, in another one of these. Bye.